I'll introduce the second binary speaker. It's uh, uh, Pai B. Tolma uh, from Art University. The title of her talk is Bose Einstein Condensation Raising and Topological Photonics with Plasmonic Lattice. Yes. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for the organizers for inviting me here. Yeah, it's really a pleasure to see uh, so many colleagues, and uh, I'm sure this will be a really exciting conference for all. So uh, I will uh, first talk about uh, bose einstein condensates in uh, plasmonic lattices that we have observed in recent years, starting from our older work, but then I focus mostly on the more pre uh, recent things spatial coherence and polarization textures. Then I switch to a different type of topics, magnetic switching of lasing, and uh, finally to topological photonics. So uh, let's start uh, from the background uh, for all this work, basically. The systems that we um, work with are what I call plasmonic lattices. These are arrays of uh, nanoparticles which are about 100 nanometer size and are made of metals of some kind uh, and uh, there is a huge amount of work uh, on these systems already for uh, quite a long time the one one interesting thing is that you can very easily uh, design the band structure like something like here in that sense they are like uh, photonic crystals maybe they are also some kind of metamaterials, but the spacing is usually uh, about the wavelength, not subwavelength. And one very special uh, feature is something that Professor Baumber already kind of uh, hinted to, that since these are plasmonic systems, you have very strong near fields around the nanoparticles. And uh, you can therefore achieve strong coupling very easily, and also the dynamics is ultra fast. So in these systems, we can really push the limits of light matter interaction. And, and then I uh, explain you the basics, basic modes in this system so that you can understand what is actually condensing because our Bose-Einstein condensate is condensate of excitations in these modes. So first of all, uh, you will have a, in the single nanoparticles, you will have broad plasmonic resonances. And the particles act like di uh, dipole antenna, they radiate and, uh, uh, and uh, they also have strong near fields. And then if you uh, arrange them periodically uh, with uh, about one wavelength, uh, of course, you will get interference. And actually what is going on is that the uh, diffractive order, in-plane diffractive order hybridizes with the single nanoparticle resonance. And this is what you see in the spectrum. So the broad feature is the single nanoparticle resonance and the hybrid mode, which we call our SLR mode, is, is the, uh, at the position of the diffracted order. And these are dispersive. You can think that uh, you give momentum uh, to the uh, in-plane diffracted or uh, by signing in an angle or observing in an angle, and it has different energy. You get the band structure. So this is a in-plane momentum and energy. Importantly, you also have band gaps and band edges. That will be interesting when we come to the BC. And uh, now these systems get very uh, intriguing when you combine them with emitters. So you can have, for instance, polymers or solutions that contain dye molecules. That's very typical. Or some other gain material. And then when you pump the uh, gain material, you can get lacing and this uh, photonic modes of the lattice kind of structure, what kind of lacing you can get. There is a huge amount of work on this. Moreover, as I hinted, you can uh, bring the molecules that you have put on top of the system uh, to strongly couple with the light modes of the lattice. So you can get to the strong coupling regime where you have polar returns. And then you can make also those lace or condense as we have so. 
Now I will, uh, in the BC, I will, I will uh, briefly talk about these four works. But first, I would like to put our condensate on the map, so to speak, because uh, this condensation of light-based uh, items is, is a huge field. Many people in the audience, including our previous speaker, have done a seminar work on these things. So uh, think that you, you can have photons and you can actually condense them as well. Then uh, you can make them interact strongly uh, with uh, semiconductor material and you create these polaritons, which are hybrids of light and matter, and those can uh, condense as well. And this uh, condensation means that you uh, excite the system in a higher energy and, and then there is some mechanism of thermalization or energy relaxation uh, for the system to come down to the bottom of your energy spectrum and condense there. And this thermalization mechanism, it can be different. For inorganic polar uh, semiconductor condensates is the Coulomb uh, interaction between excitons. While uh, for photon and organic polariton condensate, it is the vibrational structure of your emitters or gain material. So uh, you, you can think, for instance, in the photon BEC, there are dye molecules and the light gets absorbed and emit it many times, but each time you lose a little bit of energy in the vibrations of the molecule. And here, our uh, first uh, BC, which was in the weak coupling regime, is conceptually similar to photon BC, but it happens about a thousand times faster. Because we have a plasmonic system, the time scales are really, really fast. And in the second one, we are in a strong coupling regime, and I would say it, the thermalization is something between uh, the previously known concepts. So let's look at first uh, at this V coupling uh, regime BC. And there we have our nanoparticle system, cold nanoparticles. And uh, we put a solution of, of uh, some dye molecules nearby, then we pump them. But now it was really important for us that we had this type of configurator where we pump the sample only on one edge and then we detect uh, uh, along the sample. When we pump, we give such a high energy that the photons that uh, are emitted from the molecules to this structure have a lot of momentum, so they propagate here. And while they propagate, something is going on and at the same time, a little bit light is leaking, we can monitor what is going on. And this was essential because we had calculated that everything happens in this system in less than a picosecond. So how can you time resolve it and see that uh, something like thermalization is happening? So this, as you will see, this trick helps. But first, to understand what we are seeing, uh, you should uh, keep in mind two concepts the band edge of the dispersion, which we can easily tune by changing the uh, particle spacing. And then our molecule has a stoke shift. And this position where there is almost no absorption is important. And indeed, to see the BEC, we tuned the band edge to be at the position where we have no absorption, almost no absorption left. And then as a cartoon, the process works like this. We excite the molecules and they emit from the emission maximum to the lattice mode, but there are other molecules who reabsorb. And then we, before next emission, energy is relaxed to the vibrations and eventually we come to the band edge and there, there is so little absorption left that you get bosonic enhancement of uh, particles to the band edge. Okay, works nice in a cartoon. How is the reality? Well, we see it uh, also there. So this is now the schematic. Uh, we really, this is the uh, spatial axis of the sample. We pump around here and you see first, uh, we get emission uh, around the uh, emission maximum. And then it uh, slowly goes, hopefully you see it on the screen, at least yeah, it's good that I mean the paper. Uh, it comes down and here it condenses uh, to the bandage. You can uh, see this is uh, this part integrated and this is the bandage integrated. You really give it from here to 
here. Okay, next we wanted to, uh, and, and there is more characterization in the paper, but uh, just to go to the next topic, uh, we wanted to see how this works at the strong coupling regime. Now we put more molecules so that we reach the uh, strong coupling and uh, we have a polar return. So you can see it uh, from these pictures. This is the dispersion of the lattice without molecules and with the molecules with the, whose uh, absorption maximum is here, uh, we get this bending of the dispersion. And now we actually pump all over the sample. We wanted to see that uh, can we see the phenomenon also not by pumping from the edge, but pumping from the uh, everywhere? Because actually in the previous uh, scheme, we lose a lot of photons. And indeed, we can see that the phenomena are slightly different now. Namely, we see a, a two, a two thresholds. In the previous one, we had only one uh, PC threshold. Here we see first one. And, and this uh, is usual uh, polar return lacing in the sense that we see just a peak which doesn't have any thermal tail. And then some kind of plateau and another uh, threshold. And here we get the BC that uh, has a nice uh, peak plus the thermal tail. And this one uh, fits very nicely uh, to give room temperature as it should. It is the room temperature uh, Maxwell boats and distribution. So uh, also the real space images look very different for the polariton BC, which is kind of uniform. In the BC, it seems that we have clearly more intensity in the middle of the sample. We will come back to this. And now this strong coupling BC has been our workhorse. And uh, first we wanted to study uh, spatial and temporal coherence. Uh, we did it uh, in a Michaels and red uh, setup where you have a retro reflector. Basically, uh, you take like a sample emission like this, and um, then it gets reflected <laughs> like this. So, so you are su superimposing two images where you can then, uh, as a function of distance, you see that how the correlations decay as function of distance. This is standard method in the field. The question uh, is very interesting, long range order in 2D, because of course for 3D condensates, there is true long range order and has been observed experimentally. But in two dimensions, the Werner Wagner theorem says that there cannot be any true long range order. On the other hand, the BKT mechanism is there, uh, showing that there can be algebraically uh, decaying order, so power law correlations. However, this is equilibrium. Now in non-equilibrium, people have tried, uh, I mean, there is a lot of theory to see what could happen. Uh, uh, there are suggestions that you can achieve a non-equilibrium BKD transition just with different exponents of the power law, or you could have this KPZ scenario where the um, uh, correlations decay as a stretch exponential with very fixed universal exponents, and there could be a crossover. So it's very interesting to see what happens in our case. And uh, this is the spatial coherence. So uh, there is a very distinct change between the polariton lacing and the BEC regime. I remind we had these two threshold here, polariton lacing here the BC. In the first one, uh, uh, you see Gaussian decay, which is uh, what other people have also seen for polariton lacing. And about the BC threshold, we see a power law. And, and here is the uh, RMS error. We clearly see that the power law is the best in this regime. And we fit also to the stretch exponential, but we don't get this KPZ exponent. Then uh, for uh, spatial, uh, sorry, temporal uh, coherence, there is equally well this kind of extremely uh, clear change. Above, B, uh, oh, sorry, below BC threshold is exponential, as uh, is the usual decay for lasers, for usual lasers. And above, it's again power law. 
and not the KPZ exponents. So uh, our conclusion is, first conclusion, that clearly this BEC behaves differently from the uh, usual polariton lazy, which we also see. And the second is that we don't have KPZ physics, we don't get those exponents. And third, we do observe a power law. However, the exponents don't fit the present theories. But in the uh, BKT scenario, the exponents can depend on the system and uh, uh, degree of equilibrium and so on. So more theory work uh, is needed. And uh, theory work on this system is really a challenge because uh, you, uh, you have many photon modes, you are in the strong coupling regime, many vibrational modes, so, but it's very fascinating. And we have uh, started work in this direction together with uh, Jonathan Keeling's group. Okay, and then uh, the final topic about the... Uh, uh, BC is polarization textures. So, so far I have talked about like about the scalar condensate. Polarization didn't play a role. Uh, somehow in these systems, when you pump with a certain polarization, the system tends to uh, pick up that polarization because initially you have some uh, small excitation of the nanoparticle, which probably triggers the first photons from the molecules. So when we pump like with this polarization, the radiation is mainly in this direction. And for this uh, orientation, we observe, for instance, this type of BC that is strongest here. But of course, this is a vector system and a vector condensates uh, so really fascinating phenomena. So we wanted to also see uh, what happens uh, if we uh, now do polarization uh, result measurements. Uh, we also pump with circular polarization so that it, we don't favor X or Y. And then we uh, measure the output with different polarization filters. And this was a complete surprise to us that it's actually so rich uh, thing what we uh, see and kind of, yeah, okay. This is obvious that we change these directions, that this maxima, intensity maxima is different way around. But why, for instance, for left and right circular polarization, they look so different. Now, you, you can think a bit already here what could be happening. Obviously, it seems that with uh, one po circular polarization, it's stronger in the uh, middle, and then for the other, it's on the edge. So it seems that when going from the middle to the edge, it's just this uh, minus or plus sign here that it's changing. So it looks as if there is a phase shift in the condensate. And that's actually the case. We did phase uh, retrieval with the phase retrieval algorithm, which is very typical in optics from the KE space and X-space images. But this is the first time uh, that there is a phase retrieval done by a, for a condensate. And we do see a phase shift of phi when going from the center to the axis. And this actually helps uh, to uh, explain why do we have such a complex uh, polarization pattern. Okay, that was the uh, BEC part. And I now uh, uh, start to talk about uh, our recent lacing work. And, and this work is in uh, collaboration uh, with uh, uh, Professor Sebastian von, van Dijken, who is also from Aalto University and actually his office is almost next to mine. We have a similar system as before, but now uh, the nanoparticles are made of uh, magnet material. They are a cobalt platinum uh, layer structure, a bit like this. You can imagine these are the layers. So they magnetize when you put external magnetic field. Moreover, the sample is a bit unusual in the sense that we have a uh, a cold layer underneath, and then uh, some silicon uh, dioxide spacer, and then the nanoparticles. So there will be surface plasmas also in the bottom layer, kind of, and uh, mixing uh, with these nanoparticles, making interesting modes, as you will so soon see. And now we can uh, magnetize the 
particles, change the external magnetic field direction up and down, change the uh, uh, chirality of, of, of the uh, pump laser and so on. And what we see is that the threshold depends on the magnetization. So for plus and minus, we see a, a bit of shift in the threshold. And then when we change the chirality, it's the other way around. And this can be used for switching because you can uh, choose a fluence that is very, uh, you know, some idea where one is very small and the other is very big. So, so you can arrange this kind of switching scenario. So what's going on? Uh, we needed to look very deeply into the modes that exist in this system. So uh, here are simulation uh, results. And first of all, we identified that the lasing mode is an out of plane mode. Uh, most uh, lasing in these systems is, is done for uh, in plane dipoles, but this is an out of plane dipole. Uh, that's kind of understandable because the modes usually have higher Q factor for these out of plane dipoles. So it looks like this. But then there are new modes that come from the fact that we had this. Uh, uh, underlying gold layer. So we call these hybrid modes because these kind of things are not there without the underlying gold layer. They somehow, the lattice modes hybridize. And the, these are very strongly confined under the uh, uh, nanoparticles, a little bit like uh, something like uh, Professor Bamber was uh, showing. Now, both of these, the lacing mode and the uh, hybrid modes, they are doubly degenerate if the system is non-magnetized because there is the x, x direction and y direction are symmetric. So that gives you degeneracy. But when you magnetize the nanoparticles, they split. So schematically, it looks like this. They, they split and uh, in uh, energy. And by the way, the hybrid modes, they are much more broader than the lacing mode. And now uh, you can think that uh, these hybrid modes, they are competing with the gain, with the lacing mode, and, and they eat different amounts of the gain. So according to our rate equation calculation, this can affect the threshold. So this offers a possible uh, explanation of the observations. And uh, there is a very nice outlook uh, perspective in this uh, system, namely that it has these uh, modes that split with magnetic field, because you can think about uh, uh, building some topological uh, structures out of this. This, is, this kind of splitting is exactly what you would need for creating a topological gap. I mean, this system that we looked at square lattice was not topological, but you could get it in some other geometries. So that's the future work. And, and now I go uh, to the last uh, work, which, uh, which really is about uh, topological physics, uh, uh, topological photonics. Uh, it's focused on bound state in continuum uh, mode. And here are the two papers I will uh, talk about. Mostly I will talk about the latter one. And uh, many of you know what are bound states in continuum, but uh, uh, just to uh, repeat, uh, they are uh, states that uh, are within the continuum, but don't couple to the con continuum. And they have extremely high uh, Q factors, which is interesting for lacing, for instance. And uh, they, they are totally invisible in the far field. So this might hint to you that, okay, I will never see them. But of course, you can also see them uh, by uh, designing some kind of outcoupling mechanism, small imperfections or gratings or losses, whatever. And probably then uh, you should call them quasi BICs because they are, don't have infinite Q factor anymore. Interestingly, some BIC modes are topological, not, not all of them, but some are topological in the sense that they have a topological charge. And this is, uh, if you look at the uh, emission of the mode uh, in K-space, 
uh, you would see that around some point, typically high symmetry point like the gamma point, uh, that the polarization of the output binds around uh, when you make a loop. And it can uh, go once counterclockwise or clockwise, or it can wind twice. And this gives you a topological charge. You can really define it mathematically. And uh, then, of course, since this is kind of vortex in polarization in the middle, you cannot define the polarization. And that's why the middle point needs to be dark. You cannot see it in the far field because the system doesn't know what polarization could be there. So uh, this darkness is topologically protected because there is this, uh, this winding topological charge. And uh, there is already a huge amount of work on, on BICs. I, I, I cite only very few papers, there are many more, but uh, for instance, they are good for lacing and they can give you uh, this kind of uh, beams that have uh, quantum numbers of op optical angular momentum kind of uh, arising from this topological charge. So uh, our f in our first work, I think this uh, one of the first, or, or maybe the first uh, BIC lasing in a plasmanic system, uh, the point, uh, main point was that we uh, utilized uh, having a quadrumer uh, uh, unit cell. And this thing, well, again, combined with dye molecules and pump, it gets lasing. And uh, interestingly, the emission is mostly in the, from the edges of the sample. This is real space image. And actually one point of this work was to show that the edges work as very nice outcoupling mechanism for the BIC. So it's a BIC, it's supposed to be uh, quite dark in the bulk. It's not completely dark in our case due to losses, but it's quite dark. And then from the edges, it can ex escape. And uh, uh, one can analyze the modes of bathroom air with simple uh, combining dipoles. Oops. Almost, you know, yeah. Yeah. And uh, they are these uh, eight modes, four of which are BICs. So that when we do a uh, FEM simulation for infinite system and without losses, indeed the Q factor diverges. However, when we put the realistic losses on, actually the Q factor is uh, smallest uh, at the gamma point where the BIC exists. Uh, but uh, that's because there the mode is more plasma-like. However, it's still a quasi BIC because it arises from this kind of infinite system BIC. And uh, we can uh, recognize which mode is in question by doing again polarization result measurements. So, so which edges and corners are bright uh, are determined by the dipoles in this uh, mode. So we can see that it is a quasi BIC mode that is lazy. All right. And my last uh, topic, I, I really, uh, as scientists, usually really like their newest work very much. So uh, here we have a beautiful transition. We took a, a hexamer, and then we just start to uh, uh, tune the particle at distance. So the lattice goes uh, first in from uh, the triangular lattice of hexamers into honeycomb lattice, and then it proceeds to become a Kagome lattice. And then we see lacing in uh, all of these uh, regimes. But to understand, first let's look at again uh, what are the um, dipoles, what kind of modes the dipoles in just in one hexamer give. There are two uh, uh, singlets and two doublets. And uh, how they look like in the Fourier space, the K space, when you observe it, polarization filter is like this. So this is actually a way to see this uh, winding um, and the topological charge. Here the phase changes uh, once and uh, you have one winding. Then topologically trivial state, no winding. These ones have charge minus one and this one has charge minus two and you should see four blobs rotating. And we see all that, that's very beautiful. So uh, just by tuning the lattice geometry, 
we see the uh, q equals minus two. So this is actually one of the very first ones. Maybe there are one or two others where this uh, charge two BICs have been observed. Then trivial states and uh, minus one and plus two. Uh, different regimes, different things uh, play. So we have topological transitions between these states. But why? I mean, you, in usual equilibrium transitions, uh, the system chooses the lower state. Now, all these modes are very close in energy, and this is not the point here. This is a non-equilibrium system. So the system chooses the one that is best for lacing. We did uh, T-matrix simulations which can give us uh, the mode uh, energies, also the imaginary part, meaning uh, the Q factor. And you see how, how they vary when we change this particle distance. So uh, for instance, this, let's say this A, it goes like this. Uh, I don't see the colors from here. Any, anyway, you, you can see that a particular color can have a very high Q factor for certain lattice and then go down. And indeed, our observations correspond to this. So here, the uh, charge Q uh, mode has the highest Q factor, and we observe that. Then in this regime, it's the Q equals zero, Q equal minus one wins here. This one, we don't know why. It's not the highest, it's the second highest, but we get this uh, Q equals plus lacing. Probably there is some mode competition and also some other factors than the Q. But, uh, Overall, this explains uh, what, what is going on. So we have gain or, or loss driven uh, topological transitions uh, in this system. So here I arrive to uh, the summary. We have uh, seen this plasmonic PEC and analyzed, for instance, spatial coherence and shown so polarization textures. And in the lacing, we had this magnetic switching and now uh, a lot of uh, different uh, topological charges observed. And in the uh, future, I would really like to uh, bring also interactions in play. So we have this strongly coupled uh, polar returns there. We can have interactions because this interplay of interactions and topological physics is, is really exciting well, and promising. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for excellent talk. So now paper is open for discussions. Any question or comments from the audience? So when you're putting a magnetic field on, what's the size of the spotting you get? Oh. Yeah, okay. Could you repeat this question? Yeah, the question is that when we put the magnetic field on, what is the size of the splitting? Uh, so, uh, it's something like from 0.5 to 1.5 milli electron volts. So we would never see it for the bare modes because they are broader. But when the system gets lazing, the line width can go down so that this, this becomes within reach. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, uh, so how, how do we do tune this? Uh, this is just, uh, these are different samples. So we fabricate a lot of different samples and measure the lasing for this one. Yeah, the question is kind of in analogy to electronic systems where you have edge states and, uh, and so on. So what, when we tune between uh, this, uh, yeah, in our system for this, um, 
modes that have different topological charges, they always uh, exist there. So, so there is, a, in that sense, no, no band gap openings and so on. But here, just their Q factors change, and that's why the lacing switches from one mode to another. And, and then uh, about edge states, um, uh, yeah, in these quasi BICs, you can probably uh, uh, relate somehow this um, polarization vortex, at least in the, in the sense that if you have edges, you will see different polarizations at different edges. But, but it's not like directly analogous to, to the electronic systems. Where, where the topology is a feature of the um, uh, of the Bloch wave functions. He, here, it's at uh, the degree of freedom is really the polarization that has a topological winding. Okay. Well, I think you are talking is about the vectorial properties, so the essential difference from electric systems. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Although in mathematics you can map them, but they, it's a, physically a quite different. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I answer first the first question that uh, why do we choose a uh, hexamesh and so on. Actually, if you look at the, uh, this paper, uh, uh, there is now a very nice formula where you can immediately see which charges you can have for which uh, uh, symmetries and irreps and so on. So we can easily see if we want to see charge two, which was our goal, we choose this one. So that's clear, and the paper should be very useful now if you want to <laughs> see different charges, just look there. It's in the main paper, but especially in the supplementary, very nice, simple calculation. And the second one, can you please re uh, repeat, because I didn't hear very well. Oh, question is if I break the symmetry of this hexamer, can I get even higher uh, quality factors? Mm, I don't think that uh, there is a general answer because here really the fact that these are like BICs or quasi BICs, this comes from symmetric. And of course, uh, sometimes uh, when you break symmetry, you can get this kind of uh, like accidental BICs that uh, can have higher factors. So, okay, you could have, but in the name accidental, it means that there is no generic argument to say that if I break here, that it would lead to a higher Q factor, but maybe. Okay, so uh, I have to close this session, so. Uh, maybe we should uh, see other questions in the Zoom because I think we neglect them. Uh, no, these are actually for, yeah. <laughs> and they stopped asking because previously we didn't yes. consider. So, so fine, yes. Okay. So sorry for being late, but uh, I have to close this session. So let's have speaker again.